Eric Levitz wrote an interesting piece in New York Magazine where he says, you get all this like demographic freak out on the right about like they're importing voters so that yeah. they can. And it's like, I, I don't I don't think those people coming over necessarily are even going to vote yep. against like you. You are doing more sort of stereotyping of how people might vote <laughs> that has actually worked. And, and in fact, you might be able to build a multiracial right wing movement in America. Imagine if you weren't talking about internment camps. For yeah. my, I mean, just imagine what you could do if you really yeah. put your mind to it. But I mean, I think that that first of all. It's been really underreported the way in which disinformation has has really grown and spread on Spanish language media, right? Like the Biden campaign started early with outreach to Hispanic and black communities. They need to keep up that out, uh, outreach. But I was reading the tour de force profile of Joe Biden in The New Yorker this week by Evan Osnos. And he he talks to Sarah Longworth, the bulwark, and she has a really smart point, which is if Biden is not great at selling this, where are the surrogates? Flood the zone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everywhere. The right wing is so adept at this, right? Everything from talk radio to social media to the main networks. I mean, everybody's saying the same thing over and over and over and over again, and the lies become truth. Here, the truth needs to be accepted as the truth, and he needs so many ambassadors on his side saying that thing. Yeah. And, and I keep thinking, I think it's exactly correct because i think that you can't i mean the word media is because we are an intermediary <laughs> right like <laughs> things happen here and you're here and what our job is to do literally is to be like yeah, yeah yeah right that's we're right in the middle that's what we do we mediate okay that has collapsed to a degree that i haven't i mean not us but generally out there like i just don't know where anyone's getting their information right and I thought about that voter we had last night. We was talking about, like, health care. And she had, like, real concerns, like, tangible. This is, like, a real voter that you can really talk to. Yeah. Health care, an IEP for a kid. And it's, like, how voters are connecting the dots of, like, these are the things I care about, and these are the candidates. And, like, even just the basic, here's where they are on the issues, yeah. that to me is a big challenge, too. Oh, yeah. And it's, I think you're right that the mediating role of there being a formal media in between things that happen in the world and how people find out about them um, that sort of dissolving a little bit as we move to different forms and democratized forms of media is absolutely true. But the other thing that is like less comfortable to talk about is that what's replacing it to a large degree is bad faith, bad actor disinformation, not misinformation, not people, you know, getting stuff wrong by accident, right. but deliberate disinformation. Yes. And that space in Spanish language media, in English language media, in social media, and in all the other ways that people access information online is absolutely toxic right now and deliberately so. It is not people trying hard and failing. It is bad actors trying to destroy us as a country. And the fact that that information space is policed uh, almost not at all, or is policed by actors who actually want that, yes. like Elon Musk. Yes, exactly. Um, that is really, that's a national security problem for the United States. Yeah, yeah and it's a, Demo I mean, it's a real democratic challenge. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a short-term challenge for anyone trying to get any message out about what's going on. Yeah. Um, but it's also, uh, it, it's also just a profound, it, it is the environment in which this campaign is going to take place. Yep. And I have to say, like, having covered this and sort of watched it, like, this is the worst I've seen that information environment, mm -hmm. I would say, since 2016, mm -hmm. which was a bad year for that. Um, and to your point about like surrogates and also the, the other thing they're talking about, like they're going to do a lot of paid media. Now, where that paid media is going to go yeah. and who it's going to reach and how well you can target, it's going to matter a lot. But there's going to be a lot of direct outreach to people that is going to matter a tremendous amount for precisely this reason. They need to make an incredible volume of content. Yes. They need to make yes. a lot of content from a gazillion different sources going to a gazillion different places. And I do not know if they are staffed for that. Wait, they also, I mean, I, I don't mean to indict the American public because I'm guilty of this myself. We've become very selfish in our media habits. We want stuff that feels good, looks good, is funny, is entertaining. Yeah. And that reality is often at odds with, you know, politics and policy, and they have got to find a way to marry something that can go viral to a really important totally. message that Biden needs to spread ahead of. Yeah, the and it's much easier to make stuff go viral when the message is our yes. country is a disaster. Yes. Yes. It is being beset by a cabal of shadowy and all powerful enemies. We need somebody to break the rules and to come in here mm -hmm. and to take over with an iron fist and vanquish all of our country's. You know, like that's something that you can do 
virally very easily the message that we're taking care of your student loans and <laughs> you're going to be able to hold on to your health insurance. And by the way, we're bringing inflation down and the economic, yes, the job the market yes, is good. Is. That's really hard to make well, sing. The Republicans a, a give lots screen. of fodder to the end of days thesis. Yeah. So, I mean, there's definitely a fire and brimstone message that Biden could could perpetuate that would not be untruthful. Yeah. There, there's also the fact that this touches on something Steve's talking about. I mean, anytime you see a president whose approval rating is, say, you know, in the 38, 39, 40, 41 and that, right? What it means is that that person is losing parts of their own coalition, their own voters, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's the, so when you saw that 87% number, again, all these numbers, like, this is all guesswork. Everyone's just taking, like, sampling has gone to hell mm -hmm. in the world of polling. People are doing their best. But there's enough aggregate data over time to show certain things. And it seems to me that, like, those kind of swing voters are, are the swing voters he won the first time are a key part. But also, like, finding out, like, who are the people that voted for you last time in that 13%? And where are they now and why not is like the most low hanging fruit and the most. Well, yeah, clear I, mean, strategy. There, the, I think the good thing is the information on voters, the data that we have, you know, with the right resources is pretty extraordinary. They, they can find them it's if so they crazy. want to find them. Yes. It's terrifying. It's yes. very Orwellian, yes. but they can find them. And I actually do have confidence in their ability to find them, Same. whether they can convince them, whether they can bring them back into the you know, whether they can bring them back home again, I think is an open question. But I I. I do think the stakes, the stakes are so enormously high that re the recruitment of compelling characters and interlocutors for this movement, yeah. that is really the movement against tyranny to save American democracy, yeah. it shouldn't be that yeah. hard. It's a popular front to save American democracy. And that urgency, I do think that, you know, one of the people, things that people have been pointing out is like people are not tuned in yet and they are pretty checked out. Yes. And, um, and, and, and Joe Biden has not been an omnipresent sort of person out there in the world, and certainly not in the way Donald Trump was, but not in the way Barack Obama was. How do you see that? Like, you are really focused on this question of the survival of American democracy and, and stitching together a popular front that will defend it. Yeah. And it's happened before, and it's what the project that you see happening now. Like, how confident are you that, that part of that is just a fo focus? That, like, when people lock in, they get it? Well... I mean, I think that the, the idea that wins is that there is a supermajority in America that is for democracy. I agree. And it is a nonpartisan supermajority of people who disagree with each other on a million different things. But there is one thing that is a very clear choice in this election, and it is between having a democracy and not. And if you can get people to accept that basic idea, which is a popular front idea, if you can get people to see that Chris Hayes and Liz Cheney are in the same room right. for some reason, right. and that might mean something. I mean, there's a million different you yeah. know, dyads like that yeah. that you can draw. Yeah. I do think that you can get there over yeah. the next eight months. This is an early time for the Republicans to be locking up their nominee. But this is around the same time that John McCain locked it up in 2008, and John Kerry locked it up in 2004, and Al Gore locked it up in 2000. And there is this feeling when you get an early lockup in the primary, wow, this campaign's got a head of steam. They've got, they're going to carry right. this all the way to the fall. All three of those guys I just mentioned lost in yeah. the fall. And, um, and I think we should keep in mind what the timeline is here. There's a lot of time. And, uh, and a country that fundamentally I agree with you. Like, yeah, I think a lot we of all, work to do, too. A lot of work. A lot of wood to chop. Yeah. <laughs> Maddo and Alex Wagner. What a, this is just a delight. Let's do this all the time. I would sure. Love this, I just you want to just go through 9, 10? <laughs> yeah. Fly in by me. I'll let you go. Get back to iNews and Edgerton. That your old thing. All right. Thank you, Chris. In 2020, one of the crucial swing states that went for Joe Biden was not one you might have expected. Arizona, the longtime conservative bastion elected Barry Goldwater to the Senate and then nominee for president and elected John McCain to the Senate six times. Arizona may prove to be a pivotal state again this November, not just for Biden, but for control of the Senate. Tonight, we know what the matchup will be in Arizona's key Senate race this year. It will be hard right Republican Kerry Lake, a bona fide Trump sycophant election denier against the Democrat Congressman Ruben Gallego, an Iraq war veteran. There is no incumbent in the race year, this year, and that is because, in case you missed this news yesterday, Kirsten Sinema, the former Democrat turned independent who currently holds that seat, announced she's dropping out of the race and leaving the Senate at the end of her term. It was the cause of jubilation of liberals everywhere, but Sinema could be replaced by something even worse. Carrie Lake ran for governor in 2022 and fell just very shy of almost pulling it off. 
Ruben Gallego represents much of Phoenix in Congress. He's also the Democratic candidate for Senate from Arizona. He joins me now. It's the first national TV interview since Senator Kirsten Sinema announced she is dropping out of the race. And let's start with that, Congressman. It's good to have you on the program. Um, were you surprised by that announcement, which seemed to catch a lot of people by surprise outside of political circles or even inside political circles? You know, I, I don't know if I could say I was surprised or not surprised. The way that we operating this campaign from day one was that we were going to win no matter who we were running against. And uh, I operated in that manner by going out to Arizona and going to some of the hardest places to reach, talking to voters that had not been reached out to quite a while, rural Republican voters, went to urban Latino voters, we went to some of the hardest reaches, uh, places to reach when it comes to Native American voters, and we spoke to them uh, about the issues they cared about every day. And so I had confidence that whether or not uh, Senator Sinema ran or any other person ran, whether it was whatever Republican it was, that if we took this approach, that it was going to be a winning approach. Uh, and um, and I, am, I, I still feel that way. Uh, and I you know, very much thank uh, Senator Sinema for her career in the United States Senate. Uh, we may have agreed on everything uh, when it comes to our approaches uh, about politics, but she did great work for Arizona, and I look forward to working with her in the future. Um, your opponent, uh, uh, Carrie Lake, uh, ran statewide two years ago. Uh, she came very close to winning. She's a former newscaster. Yeah. She's a she's a. Well, in her mind, she's still running. She's she <laughs> sometimes declares herself the uh, shadow governor of uh, Arizona. To be yeah, clear. I should I should say that one of the things that happened in twenty two and twenty twenty two people may not recall this is that after a number of Republicans lost races, there was a question about whether anyone would attempt to pull a Trump, and basically say that it, that you know they were robbed and and really. Yeah. Carrie Lake's the only one who really tried to do it, who basically... Yeah, yeah, she tried to trump Trump. It was, it was a, it's very impressive. Yeah, so she, and she, I think she even entered into litigation. Like, her position is still that she won that election, I take it? Uh, she's still in litigation. She is still trying to contest a governor's uh, race. And I think it's actually quite ridiculous. There were, other, there were two other Republicans that actually won statewide on the ballot against her. Uh, two other Republicans, Republicans actually won more votes than she did. There are Republicans that went and voted for two other statewide Republicans, but they decided not to vote against her because they just did not find her a attractive uh, candidate. Uh, and yet she continues this litigation, which obviously costs the taxpayer money, but also is actually costing people um, some personal, uh, you know, uh, you know, some actual personal issues. You know, we have elected officials that have gotten death threats that are not running for office anymore because, uh, you know, Carol Lake continues to uh, deny the outcomes of the 2020 election to this day. Uh, and I say to this day, uh, she actually just recently, actually yesterday, rejected, again, the outcome of the 2020 election and the 2022 election uh, in the rotunda of the Senate. So this, um, uh, she's not moving, she's not moving, she's not changing. She's, uh, you know, participating in the same election denialism uh, that uh, Donald Trump engaged in in 2020 and has continued to be a danger to our democracy. I want to ask you two specific policy questions. Um, one is about uh, legislation that actually Kirsten Sinema, uh, the current Arizona senator, was key in negotiating, which was the border legislation negotiated uh, with Republicans mm -hmm. um, that uh, was then immediately killed by Donald Trump and Mike Johnson. Um, would you vote for that if it did make it over to the House? Do you support that legislation? One, I was very public about this as soon as the legislation came out. Yes, I, I would support it. You know, we um, have to recognize that we are in divided government. Uh, we're not going to get everything that we want. There were some good elements to that bill. For example, the um, uh, you know Afghan uh, Resettlement Act was extremely important uh, in that. There was elements to bring in uh, more uh, workers through a, a, a visa program. Uh, it uh, also was really, truly dealing with the issue at the border when it comes to our border communities that are very affected by our breakdown uh, in immigration that's been happening for not just any administration, but all administrations. And so there are border communities that are hurting, uh, just trying to keep up uh, with uh, the broken immigration system. And so this is a very good response. It wasn't perfect, uh, and I think we have to accept that. Uh, but, you know, it was really indicative that, you know, Carrie Lake didn't even read the bill. She actually just rejected it outright and encouraged uh, Republicans to reject it outright because Donald Trump said to reject it. 
not because it was a bad bill, but because it was a bad bill against their politics. And so the difference between me and Carrie Lake is that I'm going to really, really work for Arizona solutions. She is just going to work for whatever Donald Trump wants. And that's not what we need uh, in Arizona. Uh, final question for you. The president uh, will be offering a State of the Union uh, tomorrow. What are you telling Arizona voters about what an agenda you see uh, to be part of were you to, to join the Senate and had a, a Democratic majority and Democratic president? Well, number one, I think the most important thing we need to talk about is a freedom agenda. Number one, freedom for women to control their bodies. The fact that we are about to potentially elect a president who appointed the justices that overturned Roe v. Wade and turned back the clock when it comes to, uh, you know, women having control over their lives, um, again, uh, I, I think it's something that we cannot uh, discount. So that's step one. If you elect Donald Trump and Carrie Lake, they're going to put Supreme Court justices uh, on that Supreme Court. They're going to assure that Roe v. Wade will continue to be not the law of the land. Uh, number two, freedom, real economic freedom. We have done a lot of work in this administration to bring down the cost of prescription drugs, to bring down the cost of insulin, and continue to do uh, other great work, such as, especially in Arizona, uh, the expansion of a great economy, especially when it comes to the CHIPS Act. Now, we're not there yet. Yeah. There's still a lot of costs that we have to really bring down, housing costs, we're costs gonna... of other things, and we're going to be able to do that in this administration with me as a senator, are going to work to that, do that for everyday Arizonans. Okay, Congressman Ruben Gallego, thank you very much. Appreciate it.